this morning, uh, I meant to talk about prebiotic chemistry in the solar system. So it's a big challenge considering that it's a one hour and a half slot. So I won't be able to cover everything for sure. And some of you might be a bit frustrated because I will make some large editorial cuts uh, in order to, to try to cover in depth I'll try to go in depth in some of the aspects and some other aspects will be certainly uh, left, uh, le left over. But, um, but uh, well, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's the rule of the, of the game. Um, <clears throat> so the idea is to think about how, from what we know about the prebiotic chemistry on Earth, and you've heard about it extensively yesterday already. Uh, I will try to build a little bit on what we heard yesterday to think if, it's, if there is any possibility to have such processes uh, occurring elsewhere in the solar system. So starting from simple compounds, chemical, physico-chemical con conditions and uh, reactivity of those compounds to get into more complex uh, structures, even more complex and organized and maybe, um, <coughs> maybe life. So I, I have to do editorial cuts. Uh, I'll, well, I'll focus a lot on the small bodies. So there's not really, well, prebiotic chemistry occurring on the small bodies, but it's one of the reservoirs of the ingredients that can uh, feed well, all the planets uh, of the solar system to bring some ingredients. And what is convenient with the small bodies of the solar system is that, well, we have samples in the lab, meteorites. Uh, we have been lucky enough to have uh, space probes to go uh, to some of them, to study them, to make an inventory of, uh, of, uh, of their content. And then uh, I'll get into other objects of the solar system. Uh, Jorge Vago will talk about Mars tomorrow, so there's a lot to say about Mars. So Mars suffered a lot of editorial cuts, but you will get more about Mars uh, tomorrow. And I'll try to spend some time uh, on the icy moons of the giant planet, which are now in the, well, uh, on the spotlight, under the spotlight of the uh, space program, uh, the press, the media attention. Uh, I'll, I'll try to, to address that. So I said there's a lot to say. Uh, but it, well, if you just look at, uh, at, um, at some news you get uh, on the press, it looks like the question is already settled. Uh, um, well, uh, methane on Mars, does it mean Curiosity rover has found, ma has found life? It was on, on The Guardian in December uh, 2014. Here in Scientific America, NASA rover finds mysterious methane emission on Mars. Is there life on Mars? Well, as soon as there's something weird, something that is not underst well understood, well, one of the basic answers you will immediately get that will get a lot of, uh, of uh, attention, well, not necessarily by scientists, but by the uh, by, by the press and the public is that life could be uh, could be the answer, and we'll talk a little bit about Mars, and and I'll try to to talk uh, about this myth and question that yes, why do we think it it could be life, and why are we attracted by this uh, by, by this answer, and and more recently it was uh, it was earlier th this year it's. Uh, the attention, uh, as, as I said, the spotlights turn to the icy moons. Here, uh, it's, it was an observation of uh, plumes that were ejected from, uh, from Satu the Saturn moon Enceladus. And, well, plumes from Saturn moons hint that it could support life. So, 
there are icy particles that are ejected from this small moon. Uh, well, one of the best understanding we have from this moon is that there might be liquid water. There have been analysis of the composition of those icy particles showing that there is um, organic matter. Uh, there are traces of hydrogen uh, and various compounds that hints towards the fact that there might be hydrothermal uh, activities at the bottom of the oce liquid ocean of this moon. So liquid water, organic, hydrothermal activity, energy, well, life, and life almost for sure. I, I mean, it it's, it's looks like it's taken for, for granted that as soon as you have this combination, this magical combination of liquid water, organic material and energy, you would, you would be able to, to find uh, life. Here it's, yes, it's food on Enceladus. It's, uh, there is energy, there is organic material, so there's food. There's food for the life that is, that sometimes it's written is, and people might understand is, that might, but we have, we have no idea. So, it was a preliminary um, in introduction and these are the main outlooks of my, uh, of my presentation this, this morning. So I will come back uh, quickly uh, on those ingredients, what, what they are, what people pay attention to and uh, what we are actually looking for. And I'm part of it, I'm not uh, saying uh, I know everything and, and um, uh, no, I'm part of this community wondering about uh, whether life could arise uh, beyond, uh, beyond Earth. So I will come back uh, about that and then, yes, I will uh, focus on the composition of the small bodies of the solar system because they are a source of uh, organic material, so what, what we find in, um, in these uh, primitive bodies, so organics of the shelf. Uh, that are delivered to, uh, to planets uh, and I'll get to Mars, I see satellites uh, more quickly, uh, certainly, and then back to the recipe, back to the ingredients to, to put it into a, a larger uh, context. So the, the ingredients. So as I said, the traditional uh, way to consider uh, the origin of life is to have this uh, trinity water chemistry organic chemistry and energy. So this is one of the uh, web page from the NASA Europa Exploration Program and basically it starts with, uh, with that. In do we have the ingredients for life on, uh, on uh, Europa? And you have this list with three items. And <coughs> well, do, do we even know there are the ingredients of life? Because as far as we know, life uh, exists on Earth, that's for sure. Uh, we have some ideas, some theories uh, about how it occurs, but we, we, we don't have the complete view. We are not, no, nobody yet has a final answer about how life can, uh, can, uh, can arise somewhere. But it's, it's taken some, somehow sometimes for granted. And, this is the life ingredient list. Um, so does it, if you have this uh, combination, does it mean you get 100%, you have 100% chances to get life? Uh, half, 50%, 1%, one out, out of millions, we have, we have no idea. We, we, we don't know if it's, well, it's not, it's sometimes it looks like it's a chemi me, chemical reaction while we, we, we don't know. So it's more, for me, it's more an axiom. It's a way, it's, it's useful to have axiom. It's, it's useful to have a, a theory, but an, an axiom is a, or postulate is a statement that is so evident or well established that it is accepted without controversy or question. Uh, but we, we don't know. It's, it's accepted. We think it's, um, 
it makes sense to consider that this combination could uh, lead to the apparition of life, but uh, well, no one ever demonstrated that. So it's a postulate. So what are we looking for? So really, uh, Pareto yesterday told you about this, uh, um, this idea that life is uh, um, something that is able to make copies of itself and evolve. So I like this definition from André Braque. Uh, life is based on little robots making copies of themselves and capable of evolution. Evolution meaning mistakes at some point. It makes a mistake. The copy is not the same, exactly the same that it was before. And in uh, some context, its mistake will be uh, good. It's depending on the environment. Uh, it would benefit to this new uh, to, to this new copy or it would be uh, uh, something that is not good and uh, and it won't be uh, it won't be kept so that that's uh, the basic idea we are looking for something that has the capability of self replication uh, autocatalysis and evolution so if you show it in a different way uh, you, you show you sh You've seen some of this scheme uh, yesterday. So you start with C, so that will be our starting compound that will react with uh, R. And you will, the first step will be to have an intermediate. And if you want to be able to evolve, to, to have this cycle, you need to make sure that the reverse reaction is negligible. If, if you want it to loop like this, you don't want to have an equilibrium at the first stage. And it comes with an energetic cost. So you can't have anything looping like that at whatever energetic conditions. There have been uh, studies about that showing that if you want this to, to be able to Uh, to turn around, to self-replicate, uh, to auto-replicate, it, it needs to have an e energetic cost uh, at the first stage. So you get there, you get to the intermediate, but you need to make sure that this reaction back to the starting point is not easy. So it, it has energetic and kinetic imp implication. And then when you are in the intermediate, you get another, another C and you can use the, the one C to make another C and again and again and again. So this is an, an uh, autocatalytic process. And from time to time, uh, one of the C will be transformed into another compound called C prime. It's a mistake in the replication. And in a given environment, uh, This mistake can be, uh, can be favorable for the um, auto-replication of C prime versus C. Uh, it's a kinetic, uh, uh, it's, it's a kinetic uh, question. And then you will uh, have your loop and we, with C prime and not C as in the beginning. So that's actually what we are lo looking for, and I'll come back to that later, it comes, keep this energy uh, cost in, um, in mind. So, uh, we now go to the second part, uh, prebiotic chemistry in the solar system. As, a, as, a, as I said, I will focus a lot on the small bodies and review what we know about some class of Uh, meteorites, carbonaceous chondrites, uh, what we know from comets, the composition of comets, and I will discuss and highlight some of the Rosetta results, the Rosetta mission results, and how all this stuff can get there. Uh, it's, a, it's an important question. It's not saying, oh, we don't. Sometimes we say it's hard to understand why such or such compounds could 
be uh, synthesized in the primitive earth, depending on the hypothesis you put on the environment of the primitive earth. But well, it's not um, the idea is not to push this uh, question back and say, okay, it's on the meteorite and comet, but, and we don't mind why, why they get there. We we have some idea about that, and we will talk a little bit about Mars and icy icy moon. So carbon aqueous chondrites, it's our first our first step. So there are many kinds of meteorites. So meteorites are rocks that you can collect on the ground. So if it's in space, it's an asteroid, it's a comet. Uh, but yes, uh, to be a meteorite, it's something that you find on the ground, on Earth, on Mars, or, or, or anywhere. But it's something that you can analyze, uh, take back to the laboratory. And, and some of the meteorites are known to be uh, rich in uh, carbonaceous matter. Uh, here you have a picture of the Murchison meteorite. Here it's a, of a fragment of the Murchison meteorite. Here is a picture of a fragment of the Orgueil me meteorite. And there is an on ongoing flux of such objects uh, on, um, on Earth, roughly 10 tons a year of meteorites but much more of micrometeorites. Uh, well, the estimations are not easy to, to make, but you can say that uh, well, a lower limit would be uh, 10,000 tons of, um, of micrometeorites uh, a year. So uh, a few percent of the meteorites are carbonaceous chondrites. Uh, and in those carbonaceous uh, chondrites, up to 3% in mass is made of carbonaceous matter. So it's not much, it's a few percent. Yeah, we, we call them carbonaceous chondrite, but it's not a, a piece of, uh, of carbon. It's mostly uh, rocky material, but part of it, a small part of it, is made of, um, of carbon. And Murchison meteorite is like the rock star of the, uh, of the uh, carbonaceous chondrite, because it's been, uh, it fell in the late 60s in Australia, in the desert, so in a very dry environment. It was observed, it, it has been collected right away, so it didn't stay, it didn't stay on the ground uh, in, uh, under the rain for days, months, or, or years, like some other meteorites, it's been collected right away. So, and it's been uh, collected in a controlled environment to prevent contamination uh, from earth material. So in, in this meteorite, we have been able to detect more than 75 amino acids. Amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. Uh, among those amino acids, uh, eight are actual amino acids that are used for, by, uh, by living um, by the living uh, system on, um, on Earth. So it's a tiny amount, but they are, they are here. And if you want a distribution of the, uh, the soluble part, I, I'll, I'll go back later about soluble, insoluble. But if you analyze the soluble fraction okay, that you can extract of meteorite, like uh, Murchison meteorite, you will have this kind of distribution of organic matter. It's dominated by carboxylic acids, but you also have uh, well, a lot of other uh, kind of uh, chemical families. Among them, amino acids. Uh, uh, am among them, uh, alcohols, uh, amines, uh, hetero heterocycles. So a, a lot of organics that some of them are considered to be quite uh, reactive and can be involved in synthesis of more complex, uh, more complex structure. So this is the same, the same but in, with, with more details. Um, so amino acids attract a lot of attention because it's quite simple uh, to, to say proteins are made of amino acids. Uh, life requires protein and so you just if you have amino acids you you just add them one to another and you get the protein that's far from 
uh, being that easy. Uh, as, as you've heard yesterday, we, well, there's a lot of uh, ideas pointing to the fact that maybe a structure like RNA came first before protein, so maybe paying that much at attention to amino acids is not really relevant because maybe you don't need amino acids to, to build life, uh, but that's not, that's not sure. And um, the, um, the, um, the other thing is that as, as soon as you have amino acids, and we'll see that's quite easy, it, well, it's not uh, that complicated to synthesize a, a, amino acid, the tricky part is to put them together and make uh, small chains of amino acids, which we, we call peptides, and I'm not talking about proteins, which are huge chains of amino acids. But one thing is attracting the attention uh, is that um, amino acids, I, I forgot to put uh, one slide here, but amino acids can exist uh, under two forms, two geometry. For one formula, one name of amino acid, you can get what we call chemists, two configurations. Which they have the same 2D structure, but as when you put them in three dimensions, they exist in two, two forms, like your hand, you have the palm, five fingers, it's a formula of your two hands, but you, you won't be able to, they have mirror image in a mirror, but you won't be able to, they're not the same. To pass from one end to another, you have to, yes, you have to cut some fingers and, and rearrange. So that's the same thing with two configurations of uh, amino acids. Um, and in <coughs> Murchison meteorites and other carbonaceous meteorites, it has been found that some amino acids exist with an excess of one configuration compared to another. Uh, it's the, what we call the L configuration, so let's say the left end, it's the orientation, the, it's uh, action towards polarized light, but I, I won't get into, into those, those details. So there is already an, a small excess, but well, for some of them it's up to 15%, so it's not negligible, of some excess of one uh, configuration compared to another. Uh, and it turns out that life to build protein is using only one configuration and it's the L configuration that is used by, by life. So, and it's a big question how what we call homochirality was uh, selected uh, and was implemented into the first living, uh, living being on earth and well if there is a small excess that is already brought from space, uh, maybe that was a small push towards this selection compared to another. At least it's self-consistent, but we, uh, we, we don't know. So maybe amino acids are important uh, after, um, after, after all. And the latest results uh, obtained on carbonaceous chondrites are quite, uh, are quite impressive. Now we, we are using the most uh, s sensitive um, techniques, uh, high resolution mass spectrometry. And this paper that was well, already published in uh, 2010, uh, they analyzed again Murchison uh, matter and they, they demonstrate that they were able to uh, to see a chemical diversity of tens of thousands of molecular composition. So tens of thousands of uh, formula. But when you have a formula, let's say uh, C5, N6, H12, uh, you can combine them in different manners. So these techniques only says we have this formula, this formula, this formula, this formula. And then when you expand uh, all the combination you can have with one formula, uh, you get to the conclusion that there are likely millions of different organic structures that are present in small amount, but that are present in the Murchison meteorite. And this is one of the um, one of the figure of the uh, of the of this paper of 2000, 2010. So. Yes, the idea of high-resolution mass spectroscopy is based on the fact that, uh, well, 
what you learned in uh, before, if you're not doing high resolution mass spectroscopy, you don't pay attention to that. But so you learn that H is 1, uh, C is 12, N is 14, oxygen is 16, and well, you can live with that. But it's not entirely true. Uh, C is 12 by definition. So it's 12, O, 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 because it's the, a mole of ma material is defined to, to match this requirement. But hydrogen is not 1, it's 1, O, O, 7, 8. And, uh, Nitrogen is not 14, it's 14, O, O, 3, and you can read uh, oxygen is a little bit below 16. So then you can make a lot, you, you can really, if you have the, the good scale, you can, uh, you can really tell what is the exact composition of what, we, what you are analyzing. And this is uh, a mass uh, spectrum uh, extracted from uh, a sample of Murchison. So each peak here is an organic compound. If you zoom, so here it's from 200 to 1000, if you zoom from 315 to 324, you see that there are a lot going on. And if here you, you zoom from 319 to 319.3, you see that each peak is a formula. And here it's the most, uh, the most expanded uh, data you can get. It's a zoom between 319.13 to 319.14. And each peak is a, mole is a formula of a molecule. And, and you can get beyond that because for this exact formula, you can have maybe, I don't know, 5, 10, uh, 20 organizations that would lead to, to this peak. So that's an illustration of the diver diversity of the organic compounds that are present in, uh, in carbonaceous chondrite. But well, carbonaceous chondrite, as I said, is well, a few percent of organic material. The remaining is inorganic. In this organic material, I've focused on the soluble fraction. Because, well, that's where you get the fancy, interesting so-called prebiotic compounds. That's where you will get the uh, uh, nitrogenated bases. That's where you get the amino acids. But it's not the majority of the carbonaceous contents of those meteorites. The majority of the carbonaceous contents of those carbonaceous chondrites is made of what we call uh, insoluble organic matter. So that's actually the, what is in, in those uh, chondrites. So here you have the soluble part. And well, we have a lot of tools in the laboratory to, to see what this soluble part is made. But when it's something, yes? Can you give the solvent of the soluble fraction? Or it de well, that's an excellent question. It depends. The, what is the solvent of the soluble fraction? Well, it, you, you, can't, you, you start with water, you, then you, you move to methanol, then you make mixture of polar, apolar. And actually, in the, in the paper I've, um, uh, I've, uh, I've discussed uh, just, just before, they use a series of solvent and solvent mixture. So yes, what you call soluble depends on the solvent. That's a very good, uh, good remark. And the insoluble, so, but, well, we have no proper tools to, to address that. But the insoluble fraction, well, it's been studied for years, uh, since the 70s, and, well, we still barely know what it is made of. We know ratios of carbon, nitrogen, uh, oxygen, sulfur, but the actual structure, organic structure, is something that uh, after years and years, people working on that, they, they don't know exactly what it is. So this is one structure that is, that is uh, proposed uh, uh, by Sylvie de Rennes and, and, and Francois Robert. It was in 2010. But uh, it's not like you have a formula uh, of, of a molecule. It's an hypothesis based on various analysis, and it's not a, a structure with a beginning and an end. It's something that is spread out like that and, uh, and quite, um, 
quite difficult to, uh, to fully understand. Uh, you've seen this picture yesterday. So if you take some uh, extract of the organics that are inside um, uh, carbonaceous chondrite, and if you put them in, in water, part of the insoluble uh, material will spontaneously make vesic vesicles. So, well, from that it's easy to say, okay, you have the organics, you have the insoluble, you have the soluble, uh, then you, you have everything you need to, to make life. Uh, no, that's, that's too, too, too straightforward. But w what is interesting in that is that the meteorites that are falling on Earth right now, uh, well, they have the same composition than the meteorites that were falling uh, on the primitive Earth. And so we have uh, a, good, uh, a good model of some of the ingredients that were brought to Earth. And it's not depending on any theory, any uh, modeling, any hypothesis you would have about the composition of the atmosphere, for, uh, for instance, the redox state of the mantle. Uh, and, um, well, what, what we don't know exactly is the amount. Uh, if you have, you have had a late heavy bombardment or not, if, uh, well, uh, you, you've heard about the scenarios, the various scenarios of the solar system formation uh, uh, on, on Monday. So you, well, it's changed every other year. Uh, so that's a big unknown. How much? We know probably what, but how much? We don't know. Yes? Uh, it's, it will be some, uh, I well, I, I don't put the scale, but uh, well, it's something you probably be able to see by eyes, so tiny, extremely tiny things. I don't know really if you have the, the scale Okay, you cannot see it by eye. Okay, I have I have never seen them, but it's uh, okay. Um, I've talked about carbonaceous chondrites. Uh, these are micrometeorites, so I've already said that the flux is much more intense than um, than um, than meteorites. And recently. Uh, a new kind of uh, micrometeorite was found. So there were micrometeorites that were roughly matching the composition of carbonaceous chondrites. But uh, since 2010, there's a new uh, kind of micrometeorites that are called ultra carbonaceous Antarctic micrometeorites. And in those small objects, more than 50% uh, in mass of the of the micrometeorites are made of carbon. So it's, it's not the few percent of the carbonaceous chondrites, it's a, it's a large fraction. And also there's a large uh, high content in nitrogen, which is not the case in carbonaceous chondrites, which are quite depleted in nitrogen in those small objects, a tiny object here, you have the scale, uh, the, you have a lot of nitrogen compared to other uh, exogenous sources you can get from, uh, from space. So this is what you can actually observe on Earth, analyze on Earth. Uh, there is another family of objects orbiting, uh, orbiting the, the Sun, comets. So the difference between asteroids and comets is that the comets, when they get close to the Sun, uh, they, get, they have some activities. They are a high content in ices, and then when the nucleus gets warmer and warmer, the ice is sub sublimate. Um, and from the 70s, the, the 60s, 70s, we, ca we have a lot of data about the composition of what is ejected from the nucleus. So the gaseous phase, you can analyze the gaseous phase of comets uh, from Earth with a infrared telescope, radio telescope. And so uh, here, you can see uh, a table with the list of the compounds that have been detected in the gaseous phase uh, in the atmosphere of the, of the comet. So the main component is water. Uh, so all the other uh, 
uh, compounds, uh, their abundance is, uh, is uh, shown plotted relative, with, relative to water. If, so the, if you see sometimes black and light blue, it means that from one comet to another, you can have this variation of, uh, of abundance. So uh, all the comets have, uh, uh, are not uh, the same. They show uh, a variety of composition in terms of gaseous, uh, in term of ga of gaseous uh, phase. And you will see hydrocarbons, you will see alcohol, alde aldehyde, ni nitriles. There's a, well, any kind of stable combination of H, C, N, O, um, and S uh, will be found in the composition of the atmosphere of the, uh, of the, of the comet. That's the uh, gaseous phase, and most of those detections were made remotely from, uh, from, uh, from the Earth. But you've heard about it. Uh, recently, uh, the European Space Agency uh, sent a spacecraft called Rosetta, and it was a laboratory, a two-part laboratory, uh, a, a lander that was meant to land and make some analysis on the nucleus. So it bounced, but then in the end, it was able to, to perform some analysis. I will talk a little bit about that. And uh, on the spacecraft, you, have, you also had a series of instruments uh, to analyze the, the comet and the Specificity of this mission is that uh, Rosetta was around the nucleus of the, of the comet during two years. So it was not just a flyby, it was really an, uh, a long-term uh, long mission which ended in September 2016. Uh, some of the instruments were meant to analyze the organic composition of the, of the comet. So there are a lot of wonderful pictures. I will, uh, uh, I will uh, skip them. This is the, the nucleus. Uh, actually, it's extremely dark. Uh, it looks like light, light gray, but if you, 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 you me measure the albedo, the actual albedo, it's, it's like coal dark. Uh, it's, it's, really, it's, really, it's really dark, which might sound surprising because it's an icy body, but well, there's ice, but the ice is inside and what is outside, well, it's, it's a mixture of mineral and organic matter. So uh, I, can I can't resist to show you some of the, picture, some of the pictures. Here you, you say, here it's, uh, it's dust particles that are ejected from the nucleus. So the gas is sublimating and it's, uh, it's taking uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, with the gas some dust, dust particles. Uh, on, on PhilAe, two instruments were able to say something about the organic composition. It was too short, it was not operating as it was meant to op operate, but for instance, the COSAC instrument was a GCMS, so a, a gas chromatographer coupled with a mass spectrometer. So the mass, uh, the, the mass spectrometer was automatically switched on when Philae landed uh, at, at the surface. And here you see a mass spectrum that was measured when uh, Philae was still uh, plugged to Rosetta before, before landing. So that's the background uh, of, the, of the instrument. And here it's what was measured well, when it was thought to be sitting at the surface but actually it was bouncing. And the understanding now is that when it bounced, it lifted some dust particles from the surface and some of them get into the pipes and they sublimate inside the instrument. And you see a lot of peaks at various messes. It's one shot, it's one spectrum. A few days later, two days later, before uh, Philae had no more energy to, uh, to, um, to work, it was at, in a cold place of the, uh, in, in the dark of the, uh, of the um, nucleus sur surface, you, you, you're roughly back to the background. So there's really something going on here. 
So it's difficult because there's no, there was no chromatography before. So you have to, to address the whole spectrum and make some assumption about w what it's made of. And so the one um, interpretation of this result is that this list, so you can see it better here, this list of compounds were actually um, um, uh, sublimating from the dust particles and they were analyzed uh, by, the, by the mass spectrometer. There can be uh, other combination, but that was the one that was published by the, uh, by the, the team, the instrumental team. And one of the conclusions which is interesting is that this combination match uh, the kind of chemistry that would result from an ice mixture made of water, CO, methane, and ammonia. You have this ice mixture, you, you put some energy by photons, by uh, energetic particles from the solar, solar wind, cosmic rays, and this kind of chemistry would result into this combination. So it's not, it's not only a question of uh, uh, having detected those compounds, but put them into a context. The, the, the organic composition of, uh, of an object can tell you something about its, uh, its history. Um, but a lot has been going on with uh, Rosetta. Rosetta had uh, instruments that were meant to take pictures, to make physical measurements, but also to measure the composition. So this is um, a nice view graph that was produced by, by ESA to somehow summarize uh, the organic compounds that have been detected, not at the surface, but uh, by Rosetta, by the Rosina instrument, which is a mass spectrometer uh, dealing with the gaseous component of the uh, cometary um, atmosphere. And you see this list of, uh, of, of compounds. So it's a nightmare for chemists, but it's been, um, it's been um, designed by physicists. So they're not familiar with the chemical family. So they, you know, they, they put molecules like the smelly molecules because they are smelly. Uh, the, 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 the poison are together, so um, it's, you, you, well, a chemist would put the, the, the nitriles with the other nitriles, the aldehyde with the other aldehyde. So that's not how this, this list has, has been done, but at least it's, well, it's, um, it's funny. Um, and sitting in the middle of the zoo, uh, well, the claimed king of the zoo is Gli glycine. Why, why glycine? So glycine is the simplest of the amino acid. So it's somehow iconic because uh, if, as I said, you can say we have amino acids, so we have peptide, proteins, and life, and, and so on. So there's a lot of attention always that is, uh, um, th that is attracted by, by, by such uh, molecules. So it's it's, it's been granted the title of king of the zoo. And so this is, this is a detection of, of, of glycine. So it's a, it's a mass, the exact mass of glycine. You can say, yes, but there might have some other combinations of atoms that might result into the same exact mass. That's true. But then if you look in other parts of the, of the spectrum where glycine is detected, you see that the fragmentation pattern is, uh, is consistent with glycine and not the uh, other uh, isomers. So glycine is, um, is detected in the uh, Rosina data and it, it shows us unexpected behavior. It shows here you see its distribution uh, as a function of the distance from the nucleus. So if it was uh, normal, I mean emitted from the, from the nucleus by sublimation, it would be uh, a straight line because it's a density here multiplied by the square of the distance. So it should be a straight light if it was only released from the nucleus. The, the squares are the glycine data. Uh, the stars is the total density. So the total density is flat. Uh, glycine is not flat and it means that there is what we call a distributed source. So glycine is released not only from the nucleus, but also in the atmosphere from the dust particles. And, uh, and, and Katia here is struggling with the data to, to make sense uh, out, of, out of it. 
And it's not, well, it's not hard to get glycine. It's iconic because it's the simplest amino acid, but it's not very difficult to understand, at least in the cometary context, how you can get glycine. So this is a paper published uh, by a team, a French team uh, working in, uh, in, uh, in, in Marseille. Um, it's ice chemistry. So if you freeze uh, CO2 ice with methylamine ice together, uh, you warm it, just rise the temperature. Uh, you don't need photons or, or, or whatever. You will have spontaneously the formation of, of this um, uh, salt, which is called methylammonium uh, methyl carbamate. And then if you add some energy, UVs, you will rearrange this methylammonium methyl carb carbamate in methylammonium methyl glycinate. So it's a salt of, the salt of glycine. So in two steps, in with components that are detected in cometary ice with just heat and photons you get into glycine. So, well, it's not because you get glycine that you understood the origin of life. That's, the, that's one of the important mes messages I, I want you to, 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 to get. And it's, it's not the first detection of glycine, it's more a confirmation because in 2004, um, a space uh, mission from NASA called Stardust flew in the atmosphere of a comet called VILT-1 and it brought back in 2006 samples, tiny dust samples uh, of, this, uh, of this comet. And the mineral part was, the analysis of the mineral part of those dust particles were, were, was really okay but the organic part was very complex because there were already some organic material in the in the aerogel that was meant to collect the dust particle from the, from the comet. So it's a, it's a nightmare to, to really uh, understand the organic composition of, of those dust particles. But in 2009, a team from NASA Goddard Space Flight Center published a detection which is really quite convincing based on isotopic ratios um, measurements that said that glycine uh, was probably in the sample returned by, uh, by the Stardust mission. But you, well, you could not be 100% sure whether it was glycine already in the, um, in the cometary dust or if you had the precursor that would turn uh, readily into glycine as w when you start to make the analysis. Uh, with uh, Rosina data, Rosetta data, you, it's really, there's no sample preparation and it's really uh, straightforward in the, in the atmosphere. So it's, um, it's a confirmation of something that was uh, suspected. How all this stuff got there? Uh, and then eventually on, um, on Earth. So you've heard about uh, already about the Myler Urey experiment simulation of the primitive Earth atmosphere uh, in a balloon uh, with liquid water energy. Well, you can have the same kind of ideas and make the same kind of experiment in the lab, but not dealing with um, Miller U the primitive Earth atmosphere, but cometary or interstellar ices. So you know the basic composition, the main components. So th then it's not based on assumption. You, you really take what is the most uh, preeminent uh, organics th that you observe in, uh, in comets and interstellar medium. You freeze them in, uh, on a cryostat and then you can warm them, you can irradiate them with photons, protons, or whatever you, you're able to, to get in your laboratory. Uh, so it's simulating the kind of energetic process those ICs undergo in the, um, um, well, probably before the comet is, is formed, uh, because uh, you, you don't imagine uh, photons or even energetic particles to go uh, meters, tens, or kilometers down inside the, the nucleus. So it's before the comet is, is, is formed on tiny, on, on tiny uh, particles. And here you see a picture of what you get when you, you, you make your experiment. So you can probe by infrared spectroscopy uh, the, the evolution of the ice. And well, you switch off your experiment in the evening, you let it warm 
uh, back to room temperature. And even though you started with methane, water, ammonia, methanol, that would be, it's under vacuum, they would be pumped away uh, when, when the ice would sublime. Even though you started with that, yes, you get that complex and, uh, residue, organic residue that stays stuck on your, uh, on your, uh, on your sample holder. These are better pictures that were taken uh, re recently at um, IAS in, in Orsay, in France. So it's like a brownish, yellowish stuff. It depends actually on the dose you put uh, into, uh, into, uh, into your residue, just like when you uh, make caramel. Uh, yes, if you have a nice amount of energy, you will have a liquid, light brown uh, ca caramel. And if you, like me, uh, don't know how to do it properly, you would get uh, something that is sticky, brown, dark, and then you have to trash your, <laughs> your, your pan because it's... Uh, <laughs> well, it's, it's roughly the same thing. Uh, here you see it's a light, uh, uh, liquid uh, matter, but if you enhance the energy, you will get something that is, well, you don't want to test that. It's not, uh, it looks, sorry? So it, it was something like that. It was a mixture of, uh, well, by, uh, it was water, in this lab, usually they use water, methane, methanol. A source of uh, well, water, a source of carbon, ox uh, methane, and oxygen, methanol, and uh, nitrogen, ammonia. This is done in vacuum. Mm. And then you, you, you go back to room temperature, you get back to, to you, you, you take it out, and you, and, you, and you get that. And it's extremely hard to, to really analyze the, uh, the composition of this, uh, of this residue, but depending of the initial conditions, the kind of ratios you have, you have in your eyes, uh, uh, the kind of energy deposition, but well, you can get to that kind of diversity of organic compounds. So you can explain the diversity of compounds that is observed in comets and carbonous meteorites. There are other scenarios, but I cannot get into all of them. But uh, we, we understand why there is chemical diversity in, in those objects based on this kind of simulation experiment and, and others I, I don't have the time to, to address. And here you have amino acids. So as, as always, amino acids uh, get a lot of attention. Um, but you have to keep in mind that um, in this experiment, for instance, published uh, in Nature in 2002, you detect uh, serine, glycine, alanine, uh, and, and other amino acids. Here it's more spectacular. It was Munoz Carvetal in Nature in the same issue in 2002. You have a lot of compounds, but um, well, it gets back to, to the question uh, of the solvent. What you get how you turn it into a, a soluble uh, a fraction. And, and the classical way to approach that, both in meteorites and in, uh, in those lab experiments, is yes, to, to put them into water, to extract them with water, and then put them in a, a bath of six mol per liter of uh, uh, chloridric acid at uh, more than 100 degrees. So it's extremely harsh condition, and you have chemistry going on. Uh, when you are preparing your sample before you analyze. So the thing is that glycine, you will spot it no matter what you do. Uh, the other amino acids, it's more depending on how you prepare your samples. So that's something to keep in mind uh, regarding the fact that you, for, for instance, you would like to find them in comets in situ or after preparations, so um, it's, um, it's not the same thing. So it's when, when you read that something is detected, well, your sam you, you need to pay attention to how the sample was prepared, especially with those uh, n natural or complex uh, uh, samples. That's, that's an, important, uh, an important thing. But well, people, one could say, and I'm not disagreeing uh, that much that it's just to enhance the kinetics and if it fell on the earth 
even though you have the precursors, uh, after a while you could get this molecular complexity just because it sits in water. But it's not that, uh, that straightforward. And I go back to the chirality, uh, to the chirality question. So that's, what, that's the slide that was, I, I missed uh, at, the, at the beginning. So this is uh, um, uh, the formula, the 3D formula. The bolt means it's behind you. The dotted line uh, means it's, uh, in, no, bolt is in front of you. Dotted line means it's behind you. And so those two uh, enantiomers uh, are two configurations of the same compound, but they, they, they're not uh, actually, actually the same. And still working with IC radiation, uh, a team showed that if you start with a, with a mixture of, um, of um, uh, uh, water, methanol, ammonia, and a simple, simple compound like that, and you do the photolysis not with a standard UV lamp, but with uh, uh, a, UV, a UV light that has been polarized, circularized, polarized light in one direction on another direction, you would get an excess of one of the enantiomers compared to another. Either it's, it's not clear, it's at the synthesis, it's within the synthetic process, or once, once it's synthesized, the UV light will destroy more one compared to the other, which means that in the end you have an excess of one to the other. So it, there is some kind of understanding, not only of the molecular di diversity that is found is, uh, in the small bodies, uh, but also of the enantiomeric excess, so that's a, good, uh, that's a good model, and you can explain that you have such specific UV light uh, in the interstellar medium, it's been observed uh, already, so um, it's, it, it makes sense. To, okay. So if you followed well, you say, okay, we're done with the small bodies, but I could not resist to highlight more Rosetta results, because I've, <laughs> I've discussed the gaseous phase, but I've I've, I've been working more on the solid phase. And so one of the instruments of the Rosetta spacecraft was called COSIMA. It was, well, co it was relatively a big instrument. It was uh, 20, uh, 20 kilograms. And this instrument was meant to collect dust particles uh, that would be lifted from the nucleus at, and randomly uh, they would uh, be collected by the instrument. And then uh, we, are, we can perform also a mass spectroscopy analysis, like Rosina, but not with the gaseous, but directly on the solid phase. So it's an amazing instrument because he, it's like a toolbox. So you have here uh, a, a target store when you can take a series of three small uh, uh, sample holders, one by one uh, centimeter, and you put them uh, outside, at, at, the, at, at the outside of, uh, of the instrument, at the outside of the Rosetta spacecraft. So you could get some dust particles that, uh, get, that get there. Then, well, we can decide, take a picture. There's a microscope and we can take a picture with, to know whether we get something or not. And if we get something, we can decide to go to the analytical part of the instrument, which is a tough SIMS, time of flight, secondary ion mass spectrometer. So there's a, an ion beam and you target a part of, uh, of your sample holder where you know, because of the picture, you have a dust particle and it would, uh, it would uh, um, create a, uh, secondary ions that are uh, a component of the surface of the sample you are, you are analyzing. And then you, 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 you measure the, uh, the mass of the, of the fragment. So it worked extremely well because we, here you see it's a picture of a, so one by one uh, uh, sample, sample holder on May 11, 2015. You have small dots that we know are already dust particles that came before, but 
That day we decided to put it uh, to the collect position and the day right after we, we took another picture. And this is wh what you see. So the surface of this, uh, of this sample holder, it's one by one, is covered by tiny uh, dust particles coming from the nucleus. And basically it's, a, it's small parts of the dust nucleus that, that were collected at low velocity, uh, <coughs> a few meters per second, uh, up to 10 meters per second. So you see they crush gently, but their molecular composition is not affected. It's just like you walk and you take a wall because you're looking at, you, at your smartphone. So it will hurt, but your uh, molecular integrity is not, uh, is not changed. So th th that's how it's been, uh, it's been, um, it's been collected. And it took us a while to really understand what, what it was made of. Uh, I will explain you why. So here are two particles. So we, we gave them names, first names. So this is Kinef, uh, this is Juliette. We all had in the team a particle because first we, we named them after us and then we had too many particles and we, we named them after any first name we could imagine from any language of the people of, uh, of the team. So we have a a, a large library of, uh, of, of names. And uh, the mineral part uh, was quite uh, easy to, to, uh, to see, but the organic part was not that, uh, that easy. And Anaïs, Anaïs Bardin, uh, she was there a few, a few years ago. Uh, she was a PhD student of, uh, of mine. Uh, at some point, she, she realized that she started, we show those because that's the history of the understanding. She said there's something going on on those particles because uh, the carbon is, uh, is really, uh, the signal of carbon is really rising uh, when we get on the particle because we were not analyzing just the particle were doing line matrices to, to see the environment of the particle and the particle itself. And you see the signal of carbon is, uh, is, is rising. But it was <coughs> not, we, we, we would not understand. Uh, you, you see here in black, it's, well, the, the signal we measure next to the particle. So it's the background and it's very important because, well, anywhere you go, when you build an instrument to do an organic analysis uh, somewhere in your lab, but it's more important in, if you go to space, you bring your own organics with you, always. We call it contamination, background. Actually, sometimes it's quite useful because you do your calibration, because you know your, your, your contaminants and you use it to calibrate your, your instrument. But you, you bring your organic with you, always. So the, the important thing is to be able to, to distinguish what is your instrument and in this case, what is the comet. So, um, so black is the instrument. Red is the comet. And, and you see a signal, clear signal of, the, uh, of sodium, silicon, iron. Uh, what is good with iron, you see the, the black, there's no iron at all. So there's no contamination. Of, so 100% of the iron comes from the dust particle. So we, we, are, we, sh we are sure we are really on the dust particle and, uh, when we are doing this, this analysis. And for the carbons, well, we don't see much. We see a clear signal at the small masses at 12, 13, 14, 15. Uh, compared to the background, it's also uh, quite uh, convincing. The, the black is, is, really, is really low compared to what we see at the comet. And well, that's not what we were prepared to. Uh, for 10 years, I've had uh, 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 students, I've done some, so, some of them myself. Uh, we, we, we built a library of organic spectra of molecules that we thought we might find at the comet. So uh, hydrocarbons, um, nucleobases, uh, polycyclic aromatic uh, hydrocarbons, well, any kind, of, well, we built so this large library. And, and we had nice spectra with peaks and from the peaks you can go, go back to the structure. So we were expecting to, to see something that uh, mixed, that complicated that we were we would barely be able to understand what was there because we had too much of carbon uh, signal in, in the comet. So here you see the uh, pattern of C, 
X, H, Y. Sometimes you see the main peak of the, at the molecular uh, uh, mass of the, of, the, of the molecule. It, we are expecting to have a lot. And we see none of them. We see only 12, 13, 14, 15, and a little bit at 20, and a little bit less uh, above, but barely, barely nothing. So it's not what we found. And finally, uh, in our library, we found that we had some material, the insoluble organic matter the I've talked about before, extracted from the Murchison meteorite, and it was the, be the best match we had. So this complex organic network, when you analyze it with our instrument, you can go on NIST or, or internet and, and use a, a database. It's a, this ionization mode, you really need to do your own database. It's, uh, you, so, and, and we had analyzed uh, insoluble organic matter. First, we thought it, it was not working, so we, it, it was discarded. And, and then uh, Anaïs figured out that uh, it was actually roughly the same behavior. So it's macromolecular. You would expect to see fragments at high masses, but you only see fragments as, as small masses at, at 12, 13, 14, 15. Not exactly the same. Uh, For this, for this analysis, but uh, it was uh, uh, the, the only way to really uh, um, match, uh, match our data. So this is a better view, but I will go, uh, go, go faster. So this is on particle, off particle, and various insoluble organic matter would, would meet the same uh, requirements and match our, our observation. So what could it be? Yes, it could be insoluble organic matter that I showed, but uh, we've, um, we've, an, we've made some new measurements and, uh, and Robin worked, uh, uh, w worked on it. Uh, we've analyzed kerogen. Kerogen is uh, uh, also kind of complex, messy organic material you find on Earth, which is uh, the remnants of uh, biotic organic material that has been uh, buried processed, heated, compressed, and that's what you get, uh, the kind of stuff you get in the end, and it, 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 gets, it has the same kind of signature with Cosima instrument, or calls also behave, behave the same. So uh, I, I found recently things that show better, I think, the complexity of the material we, we see. This is this kind of... Uh, Of, um, of view. This is, a, so this is not insoluble organic matter, but it is kerogen. Uh, and people published recently a 3D view of what the kerogen is made of. And uh, well, it, it gives a, a good idea of probably what the dust particles are, are made of. So it's not something uh, flat, uh, something you can really uh, write the formula and give a name. Uh, there's n really no beginning and no end at the structure. It's, a, it's that kind of, uh, of carbon aseous matter we, we observe. So important question is how much? So here is a picture of, of Anaïs. Uh, Donia uh, also, we worked uh, a lot on the interpretation with Nicola, uh, colleagues of mine at, uh, at LISA. Um, we worked a lot ab about the quantification. First step was what? Uh, next step was how much, and to make a long story short, our conclusion is that uh, in the dust particles uh, we have roughly 30% of carbon, 30% of oxygen, 30% of hydrogen. Hydrogen, hydrogen is an assumption, the other one are measurements, and Robin is working on not doing hydrogen an assumption, and uh, is actually Uh, quantifying the, the hydrogen. If, so this is in atom number, this is the same but in atom mass. Uh, yes, uh, hydrogen is light, so it's not a lot of the, of the mass. And with some, let's say, educated uh, assumption to part the atoms, the elements between the organic and the, and the mineral part, uh, we get to the conclusion that the dust particles are, are made of roughly half of mineral and half of organic. So if you want to, to get a, a, a broader view uh, of what the comet is made of, you have those 
molecules that are detected in the gaseous phase. The question would be, of course, to quantify them. It's not easy, uh, but there are, we, we have good quantification for other comets. In comet 67P, the comet of Rosetta, we don't know exactly yet the, the quantification, but it would result in a, a few percent of the gas uh, compared compare to water. And then the next question so we, would be to, to match and to put together the volatile back to the nucleus uh, and the dust back to the nucleus. And there's still a big unknown in, in the data, uh, which is quite dispute right now. It's the dust to ice ratio in the nucleus. So you will learn that, but the winner is the one who published first, or at least the one who published. And so I know people, some, uh, a lot of people are discussing that. Don't agree, some don't agree, but the first publication you, that really addressed that, that has been accepted, gets to a dust to ice ratio of uh, about seven, which is extremely high uh, in, in the post Halle area. The ID, the rough ID would be roughly one. Uh, uh, dust to ice would, would be one. But, well, it's one comet. It's one publication. It would take probably a few months or year before, uh, before you have a better ID. But I, I take this number, seven. So what does it mean? It means that the carbon budget in the comet would be uh, roughly 7% of the carbon would be in CO, CO2 ices. 2% um, of the carbon would be in the zoo. So I, I took Pokémon and not uh, animals uh, to, to represent that. And well, 90% of the carbon in the, at the comet uh, would be in this form of this complex macromolecular uh, network. And, uh, and Nicolas Frey had this idea to, to put a, a well to say that it's macromolecular, but a, a well is a, well, a, a well has a name, a well has a beginning and an and a end, and, uh, and we're really uh, addressing here materials that are, that, that has, that are much more complex uh, that, than we previously uh, thought. And maybe there are still things we haven't yet discovered, but, uh, but what, even though we have not see, seen them, it's, uh, it's probably in the form also of, of large structures and, and not uh, amino acids, uh, nitrogenous bases, at least at the detection limit we have there, it's, it's not there. And, and then if you mix the mineral and the organics, you get to this idea of, uh, of a nucleus that is made part half of mineral and half of uh, uh, half of carbon. Um, that's the conclusion we have at this stage, but it's an ongoing process and, and it will take years to extract all the information we had from the data of, of Rosetta. Okay, so now we are done with the small bodies and we have, well, 10 minutes left. Yes. <laughs> A question. Seeing that in the stuff you showed, there's a lot of aromatic rings and uh, why aren't there any sugars? You have the oxygen, you have the hydrogen, you have the carbon. Uh, yes, so I think it's a matter of, uh, of uh, cooking. There are experiments, IC radiation, uh, that turns to, uh, at some stage, and they, they, they see sugars. So IC, IC radiation can result in two sugars. Uh, so maybe it's below our detection limit. I cannot say it's not there. But if you push the dose at, at a higher uh, total dose, then you will turn your, sh your sugar molecule into a nasty, dark residue. Uh, and my feeling right now is that what we see at the comet is, is something that are not the volatile part, but the, what, what is solid is something that has a, a history of radiation or heat that, uh, that processed and processed probably in this comet much more than the traditional lab experiment we're, we're doing. Uh, um, if just because I have 10 minutes, 
And <laughs> but um, okay. So I said I will make editorial cuts. It's frustrating, but uh, I will skip Mars. But you will have one hour and a half on Mars tomorrow. Uh, I was planning to say a lot of interesting stuff, but uh, I, I, I won't. But I can't resist just to say yes. Uh, if you have an instrument and if you want to see something, and usually in science you go, you are at the limit of what you are able to see. Otherwise, someone has done the job before. So if you are too biased by the, what you want to, to see, you will. Here is an example. This is the famous uh, face uh, of Ma Mars. Pro probably none of the people working on the instrument believed at that time it was a face because they knew the limits, the limitation of the in instrument. But, well, it's, you tune a little bit your contrast and you see something and it was, ma it was for some a proof of life on Mars. And then later on, you have better instruments and you can rule out this hypothesis. So you, you have really to be uh, conscious of the limits of your instrument and, and you have to know how it works. You, you cannot just, uh, Okay, I push the button, add the result, and say, and take it for, for granted. That, that's important. So I have to skip that, and I go and, and I will finish on, on the icy moons. Icy moons are somehow the new El Dorado of the uh, solar system exploration. Why? Um, because some of them are quite interesting. Here you see Europa. The surface is made of ice, but the way Europa turns around Jupiter, the way Europa turns on itself, modeling of its internal structures results in the idea that below an icy crust, you would have liquid water and then rocks. For larger icy satellites, it's just thermodynamics and the, uh, uh, and the um, uh, phase diagram of, uh, of water under ice pressure, but you would have ice, liquid water, and ice. Uh, on such objects, so you don't, if you ask the question how you get organic matter, well, it's, you don't have an atmosphere, so you cannot address the synthesis in the atmosphere like it's possible on Earth. Uh, you can have comets, meteorites crushing at the surface, but you have no uh, atmosphere to slow down, so it's quite, uh, the impact is quite, uh, is, quite, is quite hard. And you have to imagine ways to get the material that survived at the surface inside. There are mixtures, there are ways, but it's, it's, not, uh, it's not straightforward. Uh, then one thing is left is for Europa and also on Enceladus uh, around Saturn is the fact that in the icy moons where, where you have the ocean in direct contact with uh, the, the rocky crust, you can imagine that you have a geothermal activity and um, then the water getting into, into the rocks, it's heated, it reacts with the minerals. Uh, and, and on this environment, you have, at least on Earth, uh, you have a mixture of organics that are quite reactive. And in those environments, when you simulate them in the laboratory, you get organic synthesis, you would get uh, um, amino acids, for instance, uh, that are synthesized. So you have organic synthesis and, well, you, you cannot exclude that you have uh, hydrothermal vents uh, on those, um, inside those, uh, those icy moons, the one with the liquid in contact with the, with the rocky crust. So that would be okay for Europa. Ganymede, Callisto, it's to the current state of uh, our knowledge, it's not, uh, it's, not really, it's not really possible. And so there is a, a lot of, um, 
of uh, activities right now are about going back to those icy moons, make sure there is a liquid ocean. I, some, some would say it's 99.99% chances there is actually li liquid, but we have not proved 100%. Prove 100%. Uh, and so land and maybe uh, go, uh, go go inside and see and see what is there. And and I showed you um, at the beginning that uh, there is a lot of interest and a lot of uh, uh, of press at least saying yes we have energy we have liquid water we have organic so we have we have life uh, but we 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 are not um, we are not sure about uh, about that. Enceladus is, is smaller than Europa, but roughly uh, it's, it's the same case, ice, liquid water, and then the, the crust. Uh, what is interesting for Enceladus is that you not necessarily have to dig uh, because you have uh, geysers that are ejecting material. So, uh, uh, if you could have access of material coming from the internal oceans, uh, from um, just flying uh, above uh, above Enceladus. Titan is another case. It's also an icy satellite, and you don't see the surface. At, at least when you look at it uh, in the visible, you see the surface is hidden by a yellow haze. And this yellow haze actually is made of organic matter. Um, the atmosphere of Titan is made of nitrogen with a few percent of methane. And if you do that kind of mixture in the laboratory, if you put energy, electrons, photons, protons, you would synthesize messy, a messy organic residue. In the laboratory, we call it tholins, um, which are a solid component, extremely complex also uh, to, uh, to understand its, um, its, uh, its actual composition. So it's an organic chemistry lab at the scale of the moon. So if the primitive Earth had a sufficient amount of uh, methane in this primitive, in its primitive atmosphere, you can imagine that on the primitive Earth, the same kind of organic chemistry could have a cure, plus liquid water at the surface, which is not the case on, um, on Titan, because on, um, on Titan you would be in the case of uh, ice, liquid, ice, and then the, the crust. Okay, back to the recipe, and it will be somehow the, the conclusion. So we talked about carbon, water, energy. So is it, does it really make sense to be that focused about water? Well, the answer for me is quite simple and would be yes. First, because water is extremely abundant in the universe. It, it would be the second most abundant molecule after hydrogen. Um, so there's a lot of water everywhere. Liquid water is another question. Liquid water, there's on Earth, for sure. Probably on Mars in the past. Probably below uh, the surface of uh, icy satellites. Probably on exoplanets, but for sure on Earth. Uh, but uh, uh, it's, um, for the remaining, it's yet to be, to be proven. Uh, water has physical chemical properties uh, that are very specific. You cannot find the same combination of uh, um, well, sustainability in the liquid form on a large uh, range of temperature, um, the, its capacity to, of, uh, of putting and matching molecules to, together. That's a specificity of, of, of water. Some chemists working on, on water would call it a molecular matchmaker. Uh, well, I said it has not been observed yet in the liquid phase beyond Earth, but well, it's a solvent and nobody has ever proven that liquid water means necessarily, uh, necessarily life. And it's 
could be the best and the worst for life. Because, okay, it's good to have water to make some reactions, but some important reactions that are needed for, for life, like the combination of amino acids to make peptides, uh, they like al alanine and glycine, if you want to combine them, it's a reaction that uh, frees one molecule of, uh, of water. It's an equilibrium. So if this occurs in water, the equilibrium will be way to the left. So you need to find tweaks. It's possible, but you need to find tweaks to, to get around this. And and some of these tweaks, basically, uh, so this is a kind of complex, um, co complex um, uh, scheme to polymerize peptides. It requires a phase, a, a dry phase. Some occurs in liquid water, but you would not be able to link the, the amino acids if at some stage you don't have a, a, dry, a dry phase. Uh, more recently, uh, last, uh, last uh, summer, there was a paper talking about the origin of the RNA world, and it was called The Fate of Nucleobases in Warm Little Pond, a direct reference to the, the idea of uh, Charles D Darwin. Uh, and again, the, to build those uh, structures together, uh, there was a need of a dry sequence. So, it questions the fact that if you are in a 100% ocean, ocean uh, liquid phase in the icy moons, you would be able to have this dry phase. That's not straightforward. So, even though you have um, liquid water, organic matter in the icy moons, uh, if to start life, to start, life can evolve and get adapted to 100% liquid environment, that's not a problem. But to start life, if to start life you need at some point a dry phase, well, asking, thinking it's possible in a 100% liquid uh, ocean, it, it's to be questioned. The carbon. So, carbon chemistry, it's universal. You observe in the interstellar medium a lot of molecular diversity. Um, uh, I've showed, I've discussed extensively what is, uh, what is the content of the small body, so diversity, it's not questionable. Uh, the, the carbon can get to a lot of, uh, of comp components. The term complex is quite uh, difficult because the messy, insoluble organic matter, it's complex if you, if you um, look at it as a chemist and you want to understand what it is, what it's made of. But uh, in terms of organization, well, it's nothing but uh, organized. It's, uh, it's really uh, carbon linked to other carbons with other atoms. There's no organization. So how you get from this uh, complex and quite abundant, as I said, uh, insoluble macromolecular material um, two things that is useful for the start of life, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's unknown. But like water, it seems that there is a bias uh, to, of organic chemistry towards life. And, and now even recent organic chemistry books, they can't, uh, they can't reference to put, you know, a, a butterfly, a, a tree, a flower uh, on, the, on the cover. Uh, and it's I think it reinforces the idea that organic chemistry and life, like in the 18th, uh, 19th century, are connected. But no, it's, uh, or the, or the chemistry of carbon is chemistry of carbon, and, uh, and nothing proves that uh, complex chemistry of carbon will result into, into life. So I better like this cover because it's it's really hardcore organic chemistry and uh, no dream or fantasy on the, uh, on the cover. But maybe they get better cells <laughs> with cover like that. And as I said, the reactive components, either in the meteorites or, or comets, the 
fancy, funny, uh, interesting compounds that you can play around with to, to react and get uh, interesting things for the origin of life. They're only a tiny fraction of the carbon that is brought to Earth from space. Most of it, either in meteorites or in comets, is, is in the form of a complex molecular structure. So maybe it's we don't need that. We need the tiny fraction, a few ppm is enough to start life, but most of the carbon that has been brought to Earth, we have to keep that in mind, has been brought to Earth in, in this kind of uh, macromolecular form that is not really reactive. It's, it's like, a, yes, it's like coal, you know, you, you don't start an organic uh, synthesis with a, with a piece of, uh, of coal. But that was available on primitive Earth. And if you make some summary of what occurs if you do a uh, simulation of the Earth atmosphere, uh, Stanley Miller got famous for the amino acids, but it was a small amount, a few. Most of what is synthesized when you s do the Miller experiment is that kind of dark brownish stuff that gets into the water, but most of it is, uh, is, uh, is insoluble. It's what remains most of the time when you um, irradiate ice mixture. And here it's an experiment that was, uh, this is uh, Clifford Ma Matthews. He worked on basically his whole career on HCN. Uh, HCN is very uh, reactive uh, molecule, but if, if you let HCN react by itself, it will form uh, yellowish uh, polymers and then a dark polymer, and then you have a dark powder from which you don't get uh, much uh, in the end. So we have this idea about the complexification, like a linear process. But well, most of the carbon is available on this, under this form. So when we look for carbon on Mars, uh, we have, if we look for carbon on Mars, um, not necessarily to find life, but at least you have the meteorite, comet that brought, um, that brought uh, organics uh, at the surface. Most of the instruments, they are tailored to, to detect, yes, the amino acids, the small compounds, and, uh, well, but if there is organic on Mars coming from uh, outside, it's mostly under this form. But it's very hard. Even, even in the laboratory, we don't really know how to address, uh, address, address that. One example for linear complexification is the chemistry of uh, hydrogen cy cyanide. You put five of them. It's pretty easy on the, on, the, on, the, on the slide, and you get adenine. Um, another way to, to, to make it, this is HCN polymer. A work from Matthews and, uh, and, and Minard. So, and they work, as I said, they work on HCN, then they work on HCN polymers. And they have some scenarios from these long HCN polymer chains. In liquid water, you can extract part of it and get the adenine from this uh, macromolecular stuff. So, maybe there's some kind of bypass somewhere we have to take into, uh, into account. So here's adenine. So maybe the prebiotic source was the source of <laughs> macromolecule. That's a question to take into account. Last word about the energy. Is any kind of energy OK? Uh, what do we have in the oceans of, uh, of the icy moons? OK, we, we have the icy layer. We have liquid water. And let's say it's OK, we have hydrothermal activity. So you have the triptych, uh, energy, liquid water, organic, uh, uh, organic uh, compounds. But rem remember that. If you want to start this autocatalytic replicative process, I told you it comes with an energetic cost at the beginning. And uh, colleagues like Robert Pascal, Adi Pross, John Sutherland worked a lot on this concept in 
both in the kinetic and thermodynamic point of view. And their conclusion, it's consistent, may maybe they miss some point, but in their view, the theory, which is quite convincing and consistent, this energetic cost, you have to put it at a, a level which is met by visible and UV light or lightnings. You won't get that kind of energy in hydrothermal vents by thermal process or by even by redox processes. So ingredients for life. So you have everything in the icy moons. So you have those schemes, you have liquid water, you have the, you know, the beasts that are going at the surface and you will find uh, their remnants at the surface. I don't say we don't, we need to go there. We need to make it. It's fantastic. We, we really have to address this question, but it's, it's not obvious. For instance, John Sutherland, one of the best chemists, I think, at this uh, uh, currently, uh, wrote a, requ a requirement for ultraviolet irradiation to generate hydrated electrons would root out deep sea environment. This, along with the strong bioenergetic and structural argument, suggests that the idea that life originated at vents should, like the vents themselves, remain in the deep bosom of the ocean buried. So that said, so it's written, it rules entirely out the idea that life could arise in, the ocean, in those oceans. Or if it worked somehow, it might be entirely different than the life that could arise on Earth with access to dry uh, environment, with access to light, UV light, lightnings. Uh, so that's something to, to keep in mind. So conclusions. Understanding the prebiotic chemistry, uh, Another quote by John Sutherland. I, I suggest you, you read the, his paper from la, la, last year. Uh, it's called uh, Studies on the Origin of Life, the End of the Beginning. Um, he, he says, we are not yet close to achieving this end, understanding the prebiotic chemistry. We are, we are not done yet. But he's optimistic. He says that we are finished what, the first phase, the beginning, at least have a good understanding of the and good conceptual um, 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 ideas of how it worked uh, and, uh, and, and get, get started. Uh, we are also in a wonderful time where we can really address uh, the possibility of life beyond Earth in the solar system. Frank will talk after me about beyond. I didn't talk at all about the exoplanet, but in the solar system, we have wonderful tools. We have uh, uh, MSL, Curiosity, currently working on Mars. We will have uh, ExoMars soon that will be able to dig, to, uh, to, 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 work, uh, to, to work beyond what has been done. We have this uh, icy environment that we need to, we need to go there. Uh, at least at the surface, maybe later uh, in, um, in, in the depth of those oceans. But a key question is to have the right instruments. Because if you are in your laboratory, you have a new sample, usually you change your instrument or you go next door because usually what you already have when you change your samples, it's, it's not okay. Now we are building instruments for completely new environments and uh, uh, the surprise of very oxidative um, uh, rocks at the surface of Mars that would react during the analysis that made things extremely complicated for, uh, for, curio for curiosity. So we need to think about uh, instruments that can be quite versatile and get adapted to unknown un environment. And the best way is to have a, a, sample, um, a sample return. So last word, we will be able to say th um, we understand the theory of life when we are able to find at least another 
form of life somewhere. Until then, we, we are speculating, educated, educated speculation, but we are, we are speculating. And last word is that we have to keep our feet on the ground, uh, on Earth, on Mars, and even in the oceans of the icy moons. So thank you very much. <laughs>